Well, we're continuing in our series in Romans chapter 8. So if you'll turn uh, to, uh, I I should have said we're continuing our series in Romans. We're in chapter 8. So turn in your Bibles to Romans 8. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, This, over the next three messages, uh, this morning and tonight, Pastor Weaver's going to follow up. And then Pastor Austin next Sunday morning uh, in a mini-series within Romans chapter 8. I believe that we could probably spend weeks of time uh, in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 gives us keys to living the victorious Christian life. Romans chapter 8 has been called the Christian's declaration of freedom. Uh, The book of Romans has uh, been um, likened to the Himalayas. And if If the book of Romans is the Himalayas of the Bible, then Romans chapter 8 is Mount Everest. And so it is a significant chapter, and I'm excited as we uh, approach uh, Romans 8 today that I get to start this off. Uh, But I would say this, if you need a jump start in the excitability of your relationship with the Lord, then I challenge you to read chapter 8 of Romans every day. You do that for a week or for a month, I promise you there will be a difference in your life. So if you're needing some kind of a jump start, I believe that you do that, you're going to be amazed at what will happen in your own Christian walk. So one of the concerns that I think all of us have as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is this, that we always want to try to do the right thing. I'm guessing that as Christians, as believers, as followers of Jesus, one of, our, one of our heart's desires, one of our goals is that we want to at least try to always do the right thing. Is that, is that true? Calvin Coolidge, maybe you've heard of his name, he's the 30th president of the United States, served our country from 1923 to 1929. One night at a White House dinner, President Coolidge was hosting about a dozen dignitaries and uh, everything was going great with the meal until they served coffee at the end of the meal. The president committed a terrible breach of social etiquette. The rest of the people at the table were were a little bit aghast as he took uh, a saucer and poured coffee into his saucer. Not, not very good etiquette when you're in that type of company. And he began to blow on his uh, saucer full of coffee and even put a little bit of cream and sugar in it. Well, everybody else is sitting around the table just like shocked, you know, that this is going on. Um, but because the president did that, guess what they all did? <laughs> they poured coffee into their saucers and began to blow on it. And shocked and uh, a little bit of consternation when he took his saucer and put it down in the floor for his cat. We want to try to do the right thing. Let me get back to that premise. We want to try to do the right thing, but sometimes we end up doing the wrong thing trying to do the right thing. But it doesn't really uh, depend on us, and if we're depending on ourselves, it's not always going to happen. Back in the 90s, we saw a movement that used bracelets to encourage Christians to ask this question, what would Jesus do? Honestly, how many have wore a WWJD bracelet before, Okay. It was the thing in the, in the 90s, and it, it was based on a book that was written by Charles Sheldon back in 1896 uh, called In His Steps, and the whole premise of that book was to imitate Jesus, to ask that question, what would Jesus do, and then try to do that thing, imitating Jesus. But honestly, that can be kind of frustrating if, if we're honest, because we don't always know what Jesus would do. And we're not always able to do what Jesus would do. But I want to tell you this morning that there is a better way to approach this than just doing our best to try to imitate Jesus. And that is to surrender to the Holy Spirit who, as believers, lives inside of each and every one of us. And that's what the message today is about. So we're in Romans chapter 8. And what we're going to look at today is that our mindset determines our lifestyle. There's two key elements that I want you to look for as we read through several verses of Romans chapter 8, and that is our minds and the Holy Spirit. Notice those times where it talks about our minds and the Holy Spirit. We're beginning Romans chapter 8 with verse 1, reading through verse 14, reading in the New Living Translation this morning. It begins like this, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirements of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. Paul's speaking to the believers that are in Romans, so he's speaking to us as believers. He says, you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if you live, but if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. A key verse that we want to look at today is verse 6 where it says, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So what we're talking about this morning is really a matter of life and death. And I go back to the book of Deuteronomy. Moses has led the Israelites to the edge of the promised land and God speaks to them. And this is what he says to them. He says, you've got a choice to make. I set before you a choice today and the choice is life or death, blessing or curses. If you were given this choice of life or death, of blessing or curses, what would you choose? God said, I set before you these two choices, but if we read on a little bit more in Deuteronomy 30, he says, he gives them the answer. He says, choose life. That's the right choice. And I think today as we read this and we realize that there's two choices here and one leads to life and one leads to death, really what we want is life. What we should want is life, and that's what we're uh, talking about today. These two natures, a mind controlled by the sinful nature and a mind controlled by the Holy Spirit. So Paul is contrasting these two things. And I want to say it again, that your mindset can and will determine not only your lifestyle, but the direction or destiny of your life. So first we look at this, uh, the mind controlled by the sinful nature. And Paul, again, he says, letting that, letting that sinful nature control your mind will lead you to death. I want you to think about your sins, your failures, your shortcomings, your mistakes, like dead leaves falling off a tree in the fall time. You can picture that because that, that, since we have seasons here in Iowa, we understand leaves falling from trees, right? We all love raking leaves. You know, we see the big shade trees in the yard, but we know fall is coming at some point, and it's not the funnest thing uh, to deal with. But think about your, your sins and your failures as dead leaves falling from trees. And I want to tell you something that most of you probably don't know, and, and that is this, that those dead leaves don't fall off the tree. They're literally pushed off the tree. How many of you knew that? Some of you did. So I want you to, I mean, I'll, I'll illustrate it like this. Say you cut a branch off of a tree, or say a derecho comes through and knocks a branch off of your tree, and that branch lays on the ground for a week. 
the leaves might begin to die, but they don't fall off. After several weeks or even several months, maybe even a year later, you go back and that branch is laying on the ground, it still has its leaves attached to the branch. Because those leaves don't just fall off, they're pushed off. And they're pushed off because of the life that is inside the tree. There's a process called abscission. And this is uh, something that uh, is for deciduous type trees or plants. So we know in, a, in, a, in an area where we have seasons, when the fall comes around, trees, um, their leaves turn colors, right? The, the plants, be, they, they will shed their flowers or, or fruit happens the same way. And it's this process of abscission. So when winter comes and it gets cold here in the north or it gets dry in the south, the trees or plants begin to uh, produce a protective layer of cells that grow in the place where the leaves connect to the branch. And as that hardens and closes, what it literally does is pushes the leaves off of uh, the dead leaves off of the branch. And then the tree goes into a recharge mode to be able to reproduce in the spring. And I think that's a great lesson for us as we talk about uh, this nature battle that's going on inside of us. Because we spend a lot of our time, honestly, trying to rid ourselves of, of some of the bad things or the wrong things that are in our lives. Bad thoughts, bad habits, wrong attitudes, wrong actions. We spend a lot of time trying to uh, clean up our life. We think that a way to please God is to cease to do those wrong things. We need to clean up our act or we need to get it all together. And how many of you know uh, that's a battle that uh, is an ongoing thing that we never really can master? It never seems like we are good enough. And the thing that we learn from the book of Romans is that we truly don't have the power to be able to do that on our own. Romans 8.8 8 says those who are under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. What we are going to call this is frustration without faith. You see, the way to truly please God is to allow the Spirit of God in us to push those things away. To replace those bad dead leaves of our life with the true life that comes from the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 11.6 says without faith it is impossible to please God. Paul said the same thing in Romans chapter 8. We cannot please God without faith. So the people who are controlled by their sinful nature can't please God because they don't have faith. There's a frustration without faith. And the second thing that he says about the person that's controlled by their sinful nature in Romans 8, 9, uh, the second half of that verse, it says, remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. So there's basically two kinds of people in the world. There are people uh, who, who, who belong to Christ and there are those who don't belong to Christ. So the question is, how do we distinguish, how do we distinguish one group from the other? Those who belong to Christ and those who don't belong to Christ. Verse 9 says, if a person does not possess the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to him. You see, there are countless people in the world who claim to be Christians. But just because you profess to be a Christian doesn't mean that you have the life of God in you. Go back if you were here for our worldview series that we did back in October. We uh, shared some statistics of the people in America who claim to be Christian. Seven out of 10 Americans claim to be Christian. But we found out that there's only 6% of Americans who actually have a biblical worldview. So just because you claim to be a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that you have the life of God inside of you. Matthew 7, 21 says, Jesus says these words, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of, of heaven. It's a sobering scripture. Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. It's not church attendance. It's not religion that saves a person. It's a relationship with Jesus. You can profess all day long that you're a Christian and a believer and a follower of God, but if you don't possess the life of God and the person of the Holy Spirit, then the Bible says that you don't belong to Christ. The third thing that Paul says about those who are controlled by their sinful nature, back in verse seven, he says, uh, the sinful nature, 
the person who's dominated by the sinful nature, that sinful nature is always, always hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will obey God's laws. And we call these people who are, uh, people who are living without life. Verse 6 says, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. Verse 7 says, the sinful nature is always hostile to God. What does it mean to be living without life? Well, in the New Testament, there are two different words for life. The first word is bios, which I'm sure that we all recognize. It's where we get the word biology from, which is uh, the study of a living organism that speaks of a, of a physical life. But in the Greek, there's another word for life, which is zoe. And zoe is used to talk about the quality of life. It talks about a spiritual life. So one is a physical, one is spiritual. And it, I'll, I'll illustrate it in John 10, 10, where Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. That's zoe. He said, I didn't, I didn't come just so you could have physical life. I've come that you could have true life, spiritual life, life with quality, life with value. Um, he said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it to the full. Abundantly is what he was saying. So here's the deal. Every living person has bios. If you're living and breathing here, you have that kind of life. But not everyone has Zoe that Jesus promises. Paul makes this interesting observation to Timothy, and he's speaking about widows here, but it would work toward widowers. It actually worked toward anyone. This is what he said. Now a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day asking God for his help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead even while she lives. It's a contrasting of life. There's one thing to say I'm living and there's another thing to say that I have life. It's not just widows, it's all of us. So think about any of us. Someone who's placed their hope in God who prays night and day asking God for his help or the person who lives only for pleasure. That person is spiritually dead even while they live. There's a lot of people in this world who are living that don't have that kind of life. And here's the deal. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have true life. I'm here to tell you today that life doesn't begin when you turn 21. Life doesn't begin when you turn 25 or 40 or 50. Life begins when you have Jesus. No matter what age you may be when that happens. So a mind controlled by the sinful nature leads to death, but Paul says a life that is controlled by the spirit leads to what? Life and peace. Doesn't, doesn't life and peace sound pretty attractive? You've got these choices before you. You've got life and you've got death. Which sounds more attractive to you? Life and peace or death? Y'all are just as quiet as the 8 o'clock service this morning. I'm not sure if I'm putting you to sleep or if it's just the cold weather or, or what it is. But who doesn't want a life that's filled with tranquility and security and peace with God and with the peace of God? Who doesn't want a life like that? The only way that you can do that is to have your mind set on the spirit, scripture says, to allow the spirit of God to have control of your mind. Romans 8 talks all about the Holy Spirit. We've gone through the first seven chapters. Today we begin chapter 8. In the first seven chapters of Romans, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit twice. If today you go and read through the, 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 the whole chapter, chapter 8, you'll see that uh, he mentions the Holy Spirit 21 times just in chapter 8. In verses 9 to 11, five times he mentions the Holy Spirit that is living in you or that dwells in you. And so I want to talk about that spirit following the, and, and allowing the Holy Spirit to have control of your mind. Uh, the scripture tells us that the Holy Spirit, as believers, as followers of Jesus, people who have made Jesus the Lord of their life, they are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus is speaking to his disciples uh, as he's preparing for his death and the resurrection in John chapter 14, verse 15 to 17. And he tells his disciples, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you. And he will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus was talking about himself, but he's talking about there's people who don't understand the spirit. They don't know, they can't see him, they don't know who he is. You see, when Jesus was alive here on this earth in a physical body, he could only be in one place at one time. And so he's telling his disciples, he's saying, look, it's good that I go away because when I go away, the advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the comforter will come. I can be with you, but I can only be with so many of you. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he will be with all of you all the time. And not only will he be with you, he said he will be, he will be in you. When we become a Christian, we literally become the dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Your body, your life is a temple. This building that we're in right now, we refer to it, a lot of people refer to it as the house of God, but uh, it's not the temple of God. Our lives, our bodies as believers, as Christians, are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Every single one of you are a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people, but in the New Testament, he has a people for his temple. And we've got to understand that the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us as Christians, and we're to to be led by, to be directed, guided, controlled by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And Paul is saying, put your mind on the Holy Spirit. Let your mind be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to him so that you can obey him. Listen, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian, you call yourself a Christian, you've invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Bible tells us that when you make that decision, he comes and dwells inside of you. I wanna ask you this question. How many of you think and have thought even today about the Holy Spirit? How many, how many times do we stop and, and think about the presence of God that is, that is in us. Because if we're not thinking about the Holy Spirit that's with us and in us, then we're not listening to what he's even saying. Because the Bible tells us that he is there to, to guide us and to lead us. And when we allow him to have control of the mind, see the battle is going on right here. How many of you know there's a battle that goes on in your mind and in your heart as a, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus? There's a battle that's being waged inside of all of us, and we need the Holy Spirit. We need to fix our attention on him. So thankful that he lives in us, that we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. But he also, the scripture also tells us that not only are we, when we become followers of Jesus, does the Holy Spirit come in, but there's a command several times in scripture to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches that as believers, we're to be filled with or controlled by the Holy Spirit. Verse nine of Romans eight, Paul says, now you believers, you are not controlled by the sinful nature. Instead, you were controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's very important for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And maybe, maybe you're thinking this morning, um, isn't the Holy Spirit living inside of me the same thing as being filled with the Spirit? As I read Scripture, I don't think that's true. Nowhere in Scripture does, the, does it command us to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. That's just something that happens when we give our life to Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. But several places in Scripture, it commands us, it tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, this is, this is what Scripture says. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, 
be filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't believe that God would command us to do something if it was just something that automatically happened. It's something that we are to do. We are to be filled with the Spirit. So when we become a Christian, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. He lives in us. But then several times, like I said, in the New Testament, we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Something different than the Holy Spirit just living in us. But it's not that at some point we get more of the Holy Spirit, because I think that's, in our thinking, sometimes we're thinking, oh, at some point I have the Holy Spirit, I need to be filled with the Spirit, I need more of the Holy Spirit. I believe, I believe that it's, it's like this. You have the Holy Spirit. But does the Holy Spirit have you? You have the Holy Spirit living in you, but have you surrendered and submitted and given your complete life to, to the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that he can live in every corner and every aspect and every part of your life? Because we know that if our mind and our heart is controlled by the sinful nature, where does that lead us? It leads us to death. But when we are controlled, and by controlled, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we're filled up. We're filled full of the presence of the Holy Spirit. He gets more of us. We surrender more to him. We give our allegiance and obedience to the Holy Spirit. So it's him getting more of you. I hope that makes sense. Getting more of you to, to the point where you are controlled by the Holy Spirit. D.L. Moody, the great preacher uh, in the 1800s, to a large audience, held up a, a glass and asked, how can I get the air out of this glass? And he had all kinds of, of responses. One person said, if you could just suck the air out of the glass. He said, that would be a great idea, except it would create a vacuum and it would break the glass. After numerous other suggestions, he smiled and he picked up a pitcher of water and filled the glass full of water. And he said, there, now all of the air is removed. And that's a picture of how we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, it's not enough for us to try to stop doing a bunch of the things that, that we shouldn't be doing. But we're so filled with the life of the Holy Spirit that when he's full in us, rather than those things dropping off of us, it literally is just pushed off of us. Like the life inside of a tree as those dead leaves begin to fall away. Really what it is, is we're under his influence. Paul compares the infilling of the Holy Spirit like uh, being drunk with wine. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. When someone's drunk with alcohol, we say that person is under the what? Under the influence. And it's actually a, a, a crime to drive a vehicle when you're under the influence. When a person is under the influence of alcohol, when they're being controlled by the alcohol, they act differently. They don't use the same judgment. They're emboldened to do things that they would never ordinarily do. Maybe put a lampshade on their head. I don't know. I mean, there's crazy things that people do under the influence of alcohol. The Bible says that being filled with the Holy Spirit is somewhat like that, being drunk with wine. That you're under the influence, not of alcohol, but under the influence of the Spirit of God. But it doesn't make you do bad things. It makes you do good things. It gives you a spiritual boldness and empowerment. And here's the reality. If the Holy Spirit lives in us, he is a whole lot bigger than you and me. God is a whole lot bigger than us. And if he's on the inside and he's living the fullest inside of us, doesn't it make sense that it's, he's going to show through us? If you've got that influence on the inside of you, it should be poking out in every way imaginable so that you can see what is on the inside of that person because what's on the inside of that person is so large and so strong. So when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we've totally surrendered and we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit and that's when the life of Christ begins to be reproduced through us. That's when the personality of Jesus can be seen flowing through us. That's when the fruit of the Spirit is exhibited in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. All of those qualities. Self-control. It's the fruit of the Spirit. 
and it's just there. We don't have to try to be better. We don't have to try to have those things. You're simply surrendered to the Holy Spirit and he's full in you and it begins to produce those types of things in you. See, the key to the Christian life isn't looking at Jesus and trying to imitate him. The key to Christian living is surrendering to the Holy Spirit who is inside of you to yield to him and allow him to live his life through your life. And that's when we will experience Zoe, life that is really life. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come and I wanna read a passage of scripture for you that very much parallels what we've read in Romans chapter eight. This is Paul speaking to the church in Galatia, Galatians chapter five, starting with verse 16. Listen to what he says. This is New Living Translation. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting against each other so that you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And listen to this list. These are the desires of the sinful nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Living under the control of the power of sin in our lives is going to lead to death it does not lead to life but i'm so thankful for the next verse verse 22 of galatians 5 that begins with a three-letter word but here's this big long list of the acts of the sinful nature but the holy spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives love joy peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Now think, if every single one of us were living by those fruit, if every single one of us were filled with that spirit to produce that kind of fruit, what it's saying is there's no need for law. There's no need for the law because we're only going to do the right things. We're only going to care about other people. There's no need to put locks on your doors because everybody is caring about everybody else. That's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He goes on to say, those who belong to Christ have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. life it's a matter of life and death and this morning I, I just want you to consider what's strong inside of you and I'm not talking about is your good outweigh your bad what are you living according are you living according to your own sinful nature your own desires, or are you living according to the Spirit? Paul's answer and Scripture's answer is be filled with the Holy Spirit so that you can exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. And then you'll be doing what Jesus does. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? I know you've probably heard a message like this many, many times. But I think it's important for us to as we're just going through the book of Romans, we come to this place where we're talking about this, this nature that's going on inside of us, this battle that's going on. Paul's talking to Christians. If it wasn't something that Christians dealt with, he wouldn't have addressed it to the Romans. But I know that inside of all of us, it would be great to think that we're completely, 100%, totally surrendered to the Holy Spirit. We don't have a struggle in the world, but the reality is, is that we do.
And the answer is, what, which one of those natures are we feeding in our life? Are we allowing the sinful nature to dominate and rule? Or are we surrendered to the Holy Spirit and allowing the Holy Spirit to have more of us? So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I just want you to, to listen to the Holy Spirit. And this morning, I want you to just to respond. Maybe this morning, there's, this has shed a little bit of light in maybe some of the struggle that you're going through right now. I know in our world, there's trouble all around us. And I know that there's a lot of people who are struggling with the turmoil and the lack of peace that we see going on around us. But I'm so thankful that a life that is dominated by the Spirit brings life and peace. Today, if you need life that's truly life, if you need peace in your life, or if you just know in your life you've been, you've been following after your own human desires, not after the Spirit. Today you would say, Pastor Jeff, this is time for me to recalibrate. Today I need to surrender and give control to the Holy Spirit in my life on some level, in some way, shape, or form today. And you just raise your hand saying, that's me. I need more of the Holy Spirit. And by that I'm saying, I need the Holy Spirit to have more of me. I want his will in my life. Hands all across the room. Jesus, I pray for every person today who's responding to you. Lord, as, as you shine a light into our hearts, as you shine a light into our lives and expose the things that need to change, we want to be completely and fully surrendered to you so that your spirit can fill us up so that we can be doing and saying and acting and, and, and in the ways that would honor you. We're representatives of you. And today we're, we're, we're tired of struggling, trying to be and do what you want us to do. And we just want to be who you desire us to be, and that's full of your spirit so that we can be giving out the fruits of the spirit so that love and joy and peace and all those characteristics would be part of our life. So help us, Lord, we pray. Jesus' name. It's the presence of the Lord that makes a difference in our life. So here's what I would say. There's an old Indian folklore that where, where an Indian chief is telling a young boy, this is the battle that's going on inside of you. There are two wolves inside of you. One that is for good things and bringing about good things in your life and the other uh, is, is all the evil things. And the young boy asks the question, which, which one of them wins? And the answer is whichever one that you feed the most. So here's the deal. What are you feeding in your life? What are you putting into your life? The answer is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you're going to get to a point where you never struggle, where you never have a sin thought, where you never have to make a choice. You will always have to make a choice. But the right choice that leads to life, that leads to peace, is to let your mind and your heart be controlled by the Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's somebody in the room maybe today that you say, I, I, I don't even have any experiences before. I don't even know about the infilling or the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But you say today you, 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 need to, you need to make a choice today. You're choosing to follow Jesus. So would you bow your heads one more time? And I'm going to ask because I believe that there's somebody in the room. You're away from God. You're not following God. You've been struggling. And the reality is there's some light that's been shed today. And you're res responding today by saying yes to Jesus to give your life to Jesus. And you would just raise your hand saying, Pastor Jeff, that's me. Would you pray for me? Would you pray with me? That I would surrender my life, that I would give my life to Jesus just by raising your hand. I see, yes, I see a hand in the back. Anybody else here? You're online, you're watching today, and that's you. Would you guys just, would you just pray a prayer in your heart if you're responding that way like this? Jesus, I need you. I want you. Save me. 
change me, fill me. Thank you for taking my place and dying for my sin on a cross so that I could be free, so that I could experience true salvation and true life. I accept your gift of salvation. I accept the life that you give to me. Help me, strengthen me every day. Guide me, lead me, direct me. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you and you're here today, I encourage you to stop at the Fresh Start Center. If you're watching online, send us a message. You can email me, jeff at newhope.church, to let me know the decision that you made today. And I would love to get in contact with you, help you, give you some materials, and come alongside you and help you in this journey with Jesus. So no matter who it is, if you're here, whatever, please reach out, contact us. We're here for each other. We want to walk alongside each other and encourage each other. But let's, let's take this command and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's mind the Holy Spirit. Let's be mindful of the Holy Spirit. Let him speak to us. Give us, give us ears to listen. God bless you.